Tashi Delay, and welcome to Tibet Talks. I'm Ashton Verdis of the International Campaign for Tibet. We have a special treat for all of you today, a conversation with Tenzin Geche Tetong, a man who spent four decades as a close aide to the Dalai Lama and is the author of the outstanding new book, His Holiness the, Dalai, the 14th Dalai Lama, an illustrated biography. The book has been published by Roly Books in India and is available now from all major bookstores and online retailers. The book will also soon be available in several European languages and in Tibetan. In this conversation, Tenzin Gechela will speak with our interim vice president, Hencho Gyatso, about his new book and his unparalleled insights into the Dalai Lama's leadership, compassion, in gentle humor. Please watch the conversation, then stick around afterward for a preview of our next episode of Tibet Talks. Without further ado, here's our interview with Tenzin Geche Tetong. Tenzin Geche thank you so much for joining us uh, for this Tibet Talk program. It's so good to see you. I hope you're keeping well. Thank you for having me. Uh, long, thank you. I'm keeping very well. And I've had both my COVID shots also. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. And then, Gijla, thank you. And first of all, congratulations on such a uh, detailed, uh, beautiful book. I've really uh, enjoyed uh, going through it, reading it, um, brought lots of memories. Uh, you've, and uh, it's very special. So I want to talk about the book, but before I begin, I want uh, to ask you to tell our audience a little bit about yourself. Where were you born? What is your background? Could you tell us a little bit? Uh, briefly, I usually say that I managed to get born in Tibet law. So I was born in Lhasa. 1943, and then uh, we came out to India. I think the oh the lights come out. We came out to India uh, during the winter of 1949, I think. So in a way, I think it was good. We came out like nine, ten years before 1959 happened. So in a uh, sorry. So therefore, it was. For me, it was like being able to prepare myself to serve the Tibetan people when 59 happened. So then I went to school in Kalimpong and immediately after school, I came and joined the uh, Tibetan government in exile in Dharamsala. And, and your family has a long history of serving um, in the Tibetan government in Tibet. Oh, yes. Uh, uh, yes, it seems, fort I mean, not fortunate, proudly, it seems that uh, several of our generations uh, have had uh, the opportunity to serve the previous Dalai, Dalai Lamas. Oh. In fact, uh, in this book also, I have a kind of a pro proclamation from the, uh, anyway, the Historian Teshi Tenela tells me that it's the seventh Dalai Lama. And I remember my dad telling me it's a proclamation from the fifth Dalai Lama. Whatever it is, but in that proclamation, it says that uh, the Tetong family uh, has had good uh, religious relations with uh, Teshi Lompo, and that in the case of the Dalai Lamas, they, uh, they stood on the right side. So yes, several, several, I think several generations, you know, had had close associations, association with the Dalai Lamas. And of course, my grandfather uh, uh, became the governor of uh, Kham in the, I think 1930s and fought the Chinese about which I'm very proud. <laughs> During the 13th uh, Dalai Lama's time. 
Love it. No? Yes. Yes. And uh, in your generation, also, your brother is uh, uh, one of the founding members of uh, our organization, also. And we'll uh, we'll touch more upon your brother as well when we speak about His Holiness's visit to the United States. But um, following that, can you? Can you tell us how did you start uh, in um, service of His Holiness? Because altogether, I think you served His Holiness for over four decades from um, the early 60s until your retirement in 2007, I think. How did you start and how your just like an uh, overview of your experience? Uh, the way I came to uh, serve in the Office of His Holiness itself, I sometimes tell my friends that uh, actually I was able to get into the private office by default. And what I meant was, because I was at that time working in the education office, uh, Council for Tibetan Education. And then- uh, You Rattela, had just finished who school later, and you were- Yes, you were school and about I was, 20, 19 or 20? About 20, long. Mm -hmm. And I was uh, working in the education office. And uh, Rabdanla, who later became a secretary for uh, education, he was in the private office. Then he got a scholarship to study in the States and left the, uh, Office of His Holiness. So then I was recruited to replace him. That's how I came up there. <laughs> and this was 1963. Uh, I think it was 63. 63 and, in the beginning or middle. And, and His Holiness would have been in Dharamsala then around uh, three, four years? Two, three years only. Because years. Oh. 59, he was in Masuri. Oh yeah, uh, about three years, or the third year. It was the and third year. I read uh, your recollection of your first meeting with His Holiness in your book. Can you share? Can you tell us about that? Actually, that first meeting just there was not much to talk about. But uh, of course, there was a great deal of excitement for me because. My father, who also is an ex Tibetan of official, and then also he's a very religious minded person. So, from my young age, he always used to talk about uh, His Holiness and the Tibetan government. And then, of course, when I was about maybe 15, 14, 15, 56, the Holiness and the Panchen Lama came to India for the Buddhist Chanty celebration at the invitation of uh, Prime Minister Pandit Nehru. Mm -hmm. So we were also uh, doing our pilgrimage in India. And then when we were in Sana, His Solness uh, and the Panchen Lama came there. And then uh, there was a teaching by His Holiness. And uh, now I don't even remember what it was. Anyway, uh, then of course with great excitement, went and attended that teaching. And uh, now I don't remember very much of the actual feeling I had at the time. <laughs> but I'm sure I was you know, very excited because of all what my you know, father told me about. But that was when you were probably in your early teens. Uh, I think I was about 15. 15, 15, 15. And but when you started your first um, your job uh, uh, in service of His Holiness at the Swag Ashram, which is the former residence of His Holiness in Dharamsala, you mentioned you um, visited uh, His Holiness's uh, um, room where he was staying then, and uh, how the situation was there. How was that meeting after you? started at the private office as, uh, as having his whole as your boss. It, Larry, uh, oh, you know, it was a great privilege to be able to, you know, join the office in those early days. 
for example, I mentioned in the book also, like uh, I would, I wonder who would have an opportunity like to play a bad, badminton <laughs> game with his holiness, Rava. Oh. And then of course, often uh, at the time, uh, because I become a monk and I, uh, on the instruction of his holiness, uh, with Nara we used to go Narayana and- uh, is his holiness, uh, his younger brother. Now, we used to take this uh, teachings from the abbot of the Namgyal Monastery. So often his holiness, you know, used to ask me how the teaching went and all that. Anyway. Uh, how how many way, people do, was the, is it was a small group at uh, oh, what was the small setup group. like? No, it was very small and very simple though. Mm -hmm. uh, as I tried, I don't know whether it's in the actual text of the book or not, but uh, the private office was just a small room where there was a, a kind of a long table in the middle. And as far as I remember, when I started working there, I was like the typist in the office. And on the other side, uh, uh, we had this uh, Chamba Yundela, who was like the uh, Tibetan clerk. Mm -hmm. And then there was Kon Tara, Venerable T.C. Tara, and uh, Sandhu Rinjila. English translator. And, yes, that's about all. About four of us in that small room. And uh, and that room was His Holiness's residence, office, plus his family and close entourage all lived in, nearby. Yes, the Swak Ashram Bungalow, I didn't, which was an old uh, English bungalow, maybe. But later, uh, the owner was an Indian gentleman living in Bombay. But anyway, it was just a fairly, fairly big bungalow. So there, His Holiness had his uh, office, his own residence, His Holiness's mother. I think your mother also used to live there. And then, of course, the st staff members as well. As far as the office staff members are concerned, there was an outhouse next to the main bungalow. We used to live in actually two or three rooms there. And you wrote um, in your book, I, wrote, I read, um, he said, um, but it was days of relentless work, he said. That was during those yes. years when His Holiness uh, planted the seed for all that we have today from the Absolutely. democratic system Absolutely. to the schools, to the monasteries, to all, all the seeds were planted then. So can, how, can you tell us? No, very true. In fact, uh, I have a very bad memory, <laughs> but I remember very clearly that uh, for one thing like, uh, as soon as I joined the office, there were all these uh, letters, appeal letters that his owner was writing to world leaders to get support for the Tibetan uh, issue to be discussed in the United Nations. Then in those early days, his owner used to write all these letters to uh, mainly Pandit Nehru uh, regarding the establishment of the Tibetan schools, uh, the settlements, and then eventually the cultural institutions. And uh, uh, I mean, you know, uh, he was so concerned about uh, starting the schools and then the settlements. And uh, in some ways, I was in the beginning quite surprised that, you know, before the monks were settled, you know, the schools had already been established. In fact, uh, 59 in Masuri itself, the soldiers started the first Tibetan school there. And then subsequently all these other schools came up. And uh, uh, then the uh, work of starting the settlements uh, began. And many of these settlements, they started from scratch law, yeah. clearing and the just jungle. Just to put into context for our viewers, um, this was a time when um, 
the Tibetans had just arrived in India for as refugees, many of them facing new to the situation, the climate, you know, facing all of those difficulties, Absolutely. right? And um, many just came with just the clothes on their backs. They didn't have anything. And, uh, yeah. and, and the job that was available was road work, which was not easy in the Himalayas. Um, and that was the situation uh, at that from where, where His Holiness was trying to build this base. Very true. Now, in those days, it was really, truly uh, a very difficult uh, period. And uh, I think with the Solonists' leadership and then the hard work and the trust of the Tibetan people, mm. you know, uh, gradually we were able to build up this Tibetan uh, community in exile and become so successful. Mm. Actually, I'm glad you brought up this matter because I wanted to choose one picture showing uh, the Tibetans first arriving in India, you know, the, con the kind of condition they were in at that time. And now I think, you know, our schools, uh, settlements, they are doing extremely well, I think. Thanks, of course, uh, to Solness for setting up that uh, really yes, without foundation. Foundation. Now. Exactly, without that kind of vision. And I'm always amazed when I sometimes come across videos of Hetholne speaking when he had just arrived. He was so young then. But whenever he spoke, he spoke, he speaks the same about the same things that he does now. He was quote, a real visionary leader. And we um, really um, uh, led us in the, through the hardest of times. Um, so, Tanskitla, what do you think were some of the key influences for his wholeness at, at that early uh, time, in those early ages? Uh, I don't know about the influences, but just as you mentioned, I have always, and, and I, I, I still uh, continue to be amazed that at such a young age, his oldest was hardly 24, 25 when he first came into India. And then on top of that, in Tibet, his oldest led a life, you know, kind of uh, very privileged and, you know, he was held in the highest esteem. He was sort of all powerful uh, leader in Tibet. Yet when he came, into exile in India, Solonis was so practical. And uh, one of the things that I uh, remember very clearly is in 59, before I joined the uh, uh, government, I came during one of the winter vacations and I met uh, several of uh, the senior Tibetan officials. And I remember Many of them, they thought, or they were of the opinion that uh, the, uh, e the exile of the Tibetans would be for a period of, at the most, three, four, three, four years, and then soon we'll be able to return. Fortunately, the Solonists thought much beyond that and then prepared for the worst. And so thanks to that kind of a uh, far-sightedness uh, on on the part of his illness, then you know I think all this work of starting the schools, settlements, uh, setting up of the monasteries and the cultural institution, that's how it all happened. And I think we're glad that yeah. you know, his in, the face, had that. in the face of such uh, lo big loss, his illness found the um, um, the energy and the vision to move forward. And, in, and uh, even uh, more from doing all of that, in the midst of all this, he continued his own religious practices. And he took teachings in those early years from all the different sects of Tibetan Buddhism. And I find it, that also very, very special in um, from having this from such a young uh, age, this kind of attitude. 
absolutely, absolutely. Look, uh, not only during those early years, you know, for example, as soon as, soon as often uh, during his teachings, when he's talking about, you know, how important, of course, first of all, how important it is for monk students to, you know, really uh, take uh, the study of Buddhist philosophy seriously. But not only monk students, he also encourages lay people to study and know about Buddhism. And then in relation to that, the Solness often used to say that he seriously became uh, interested in Buddhist studies when he was maybe around 15, 16. But okay, as you say, like in the early uh, period when the Solness just had come out, he continued in spite of all these problems of looking after the refugee, having just come into exile, you know, he continued his studies. But the amazing thing is, even 20, 30 years later, mm -hmm. I remember on some of these uh, trips abroad, when his holiness had such a busy schedule, in the midst of that busy schedule, his holiness often had his, you know, study scripture with him. And if, you know, he had an opportunity, you know, to do a little bit of reading, he would take that opportunity. That was, that I thought was really amazing now. Yeah. And then he often now also says, he continues to study. And uh, even in his late eighties, he continues to study. And then that way encourages other people that you must study. No. Oh, in, yeah. fact, mm -hmm. in fact, in uh, fact, Tenjula, I think this is one of the uh, really important teachings of His Holiness to the Tibetan people, that you have to know about your own culture and study them and, you know, uh, be industrious in uh, something that is important to your own people. Absolutely. And uh, you touched upon His Holiness's uh, trips abroad, um, and uh, you accompanied His Holiness's on right from those first trips uh, out, outside of India, including uh, to the United States. Uh, can you tell us how those were? Because it's so different from what you know, what we remember, what we have seen in the last few years. Those early years were very different. So, could you maybe share a little bit about those? No, in the uh, in the early years, uh, in some ways, I think we enjoyed those early days <laughs> when His Holiness's schedules were not so hectic like these days. And uh, in the early days, you know, uh, mainly because of the uh, Tibetan political situation and the uh, attitude of the Western world. Uh, His Holiness just mainly concentrated on uh, uh, talking about uh, compassion, nonviolence, and uh, and where people were interested in uh, giving some teachings or explanations about Buddhism. And uh, but you know this is the amazing thing, as you also. Uh, found that from those days, His Holiness's ideas were so kind of advanced law. Even today, they seem to be applicable and uh, topics that His Holiness is still continuing. For example, Absolutely. like long, no, for example, like interreligious understanding. Right from his first trips to West and even to the United States, you know, that was one of the key sort of uh, interest that his holiness had. So I remember uh, Dr. Richie Davidson, who his holiness works closely with uh, and the uh, um, science of the mind uh, field, says that um, when his holiness started talking about compassion, it wasn't even, a, it wasn't a word that was to be found in any textbook in America. And now, mm -hmm. It is 
the word that's on the tip of uh, the, uh, most people's minds um, when you speak about uh, compassion. And speaker, uh, uh, speaker Nancy Pelosi also says his illness was the first Nobel laureate to speak about the need to take care of the environment. So he was a trailblazer in um, many of these areas. And here, um, our organization in, is in America. We have lots of ICT members who care about his wholeness. And I'm always amazed at how people, how much affinity and love people have for his wholeness here in this country as well, you know, as around the world. Um, even when we go um, through our work, we go to um, Congress. I see many congressional offices would have photos of his holiness meetings and his holiness in most unexpected places. So can you tell us about a little about his holiness's first visit to the United States in 1979 and subsequently um, how, how you saw his, this um, uh, love and affinity um, for his holiness grow? Uh, I think, you know, uh, one of the, not one, uh, I think there are a number of things that uh, uh, made his holiness, uh, I don't know whether this is the right word, made his holiness so popular or people were so uh, interested in hearing him talk is because, you know, his holiness, in spite of the terrible uh, situation about Tibet at that time in the early 70s, you know, His Holiness hardly talked about the political side of the Tibetan story, but only concentrated on talking about nonviolence, interreligious understanding, uh, forgiveness, and uh, uh, I think uh, because his holiness, oh, in spite of in spite of the tremendous interest people showed, it's amazing even during those first uh, visits across the United States in '79, there were so many people who were interested in you know, listening to his holiness, and. Uh, uh, in spite of that interest and many people coming to listen to him, His Holiness, I think, you know, tried not to take advantage of the interest shown to His Holiness. And so he, unless somebody asked him specifically a question about Tibet, he refrained from speaking about Tibet or Buddhism and only talked about general subject matters like compassion, forgiveness, and environment, maybe. Anyway, and then uh, because of this kind of universal message that His Holiness was trying to promote, and also because, you know, His Holiness is very spontaneous. So I think these things really sort of attracted many people and became ardent, followers of His Holiness, which indirectly led to a great deal of support for Tibet and the Tibetan people. Absolutely. And sometimes yes. that's true, yes. And I recall when uh, in a previous episode of our Tibet Talks, we had as a guest uh, your brother, Denzin Namgye Tertong, Denzin Namgye La, yeah. who was representative of His Holiness during that uh, first uh, visit. And he also told us how, how difficult, first of all, arranging and uh, uh, getting the visa and the difficult political situation was then. Uh, but then and on arrival here, um, they weren't sure how the first um, public talks would go. But when they arrived at each place, they said they were surprised to find um, the halls were packed. And that um, I read, one of the reporters uh, had written an article that I came across as I was 
um, you know, researching something and he, he had written that he went in very skeptical who is this god king that's coming and that this is from every description this is the type of person that um, um, I won't like but I will just go and see and then he went there and he came out of it completely taken by his holiness and wrote a wonderful article very true I had personally met many people who had similar kind of uh, experiences. Mm -hmm. When they first met a soulness, you know, they were quite skeptical or at least not so enthusiastic. Mm -hmm. But after a few meetings with the soulness, you know, they really changed completely. No, yeah. amazing. I think yeah. the soulness's openness is. Uh, his nature of being very natural. So all these things I think, I think helped. And then also I uh, had, uh, I uh, recall somebody uh, had said once that um, I think his holiness had received maybe some criticism about his first visits, uh, travels being only about love and compassion and he's not talking about Tibet, um, but Kongo uh, Tarala uh, reprimanded saying, oh, that is very uh, small thinking of you because you don't understand His Holiness's master plan. Is the response. <laughs> That's what I've heard. And it seems to be so. I think, yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head. But actually, in those early days, I think it was also a little political. Mm -hmm. You know, many of the Western countries, they were a little cautious about, you know, His Holiness not being too political. Although there were no sort of outright uh, uh, ban or restrictions, but his holiness, as you know, is very understanding. So he also refrained, as I mentioned earlier, refrained from talking about Buddhism or even uh, the issue of Tibet, unless somebody asked him specifically about the yeah. uh, developing uh, the uh, and those and those relationships were what led to the political support. So, and the United States Congress, I think, was one of the first platforms to offer His Holiness a platform to speak on politics. Um, and His Holiness had uh, put forth a major um, peace plan for Tibet. Can you tell us how that moment was when his that first invitation to speak um, at Congress uh, and then the, what ensued um, after those? Actually, Honestly speaking, I don't remember very clearly. You know, I think you should have asked that to Tenten Namjala. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I think, uh, as far as I remember, uh, two uh, congressmen who really played a very important role in giving His Holiness a platform to speak about Tibet in the in the in the Capitol Hill was. Uh, Congressman Charlie Rose, and then uh, was it Congressman Lantos? Lantos, yes, Congressman Lantos, yeah. yes. Congressman yeah. Charlie Rose's uh, um, staff is still on our ICT board. He's a very yeah, must be, must active be uh, board member, yes. And his holiness presented the five point peace yeah. plan for Tibet then. Very right. He and, really showed in you know, giving the soulness an opportunity to, to speak about Tibet in uh, the Congress and the, later with senators as well. Now, you know, at one time, I, 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 Tenjala, at one time, I was amazed that the most powerful people in the Congress and the most powerful people in the Senate were pro Dalai Lama. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I saw it oh. with my own eyes uh, when His Holiness was here during his last trip. It was a time when um, you know, the United States Congress was very divided. Um, we, the Republicans and uh, Democrat platforms were, you know, uh, very difficult. But with, with His Holiness's presence brought both the speaker, oh, yes. everybody mm -hmm. together. And there's no, uh, every, you know, we're very lucky and grateful that way. And Tibet is one of the 
items that brings all of Congress uh, together and it brings the best of everyone out. And that's only because of his holiness and his vision and the nonviolent way that uh, Tibetan struggle has been uh, portrayed. Ooh, very yeah, mm. um, so uh, now I will have requested you to uh, uh, speak on, uh, to select three photographs to speak on. And Nenske Jila, I have, uh, you have kindly selected to choose uh, three photographs um, from your book. And may I ask you to speak on the first one, maybe um, uh, you had selected the one uh, of His Holiness's mother and uh, elder brother, Lovsan Samdela. Middle brother, yes, His Holiness had. Anyway, His Holiness's elder brother. Oh. Now, I chose that because uh, uh, I have a great deal of uh, respect for both of them, uh, especially His Holiness's uh, mother, who Maybe I'm a little biased because she was always kind to me, and uh, in some ways I. You were almost think, like a family member. You were very close with the, with the Solnes siblings. Yes, yes, true. But you know, I used to think maybe Jayum uh, Chamo, as we call Solnes's mother, was uh, sort of specially kind to me because I had a, a special relationship with. His Holiness is youngest brother. And uh, in fact, uh, at one time when Rinpoche suffered from some kind of a depression, I was one of the very few who Rinpoche agreed to meet with. Mm. And then on the other hand, I thought also, maybe because she also was kind to me, nice to me, because I was working in the office of His Holiness. But I personally personally would like to think Jayum Chamu liked me. And I think uh, maybe I'm not completely wrong because she used to be really kind to me. And I remember, you know, often uh, she used to call and say, today she's making some meal that I particularly like. I mean, she, you know, she used to invite me to come down and have the meal with them. So, and then of course, the, the reason why I respect her is Yerim uh, Chamu was such a kind person and such a gentle person. And uh, besides that, uh, I respected her because I felt she never misused her position as the Solness's mother. Mm -hmm. So that, that sort of, is one of my main reasons why I have such a great respect yep. for Jumo. And, for, for, and as a woman also, I look at uh, her life and I think of how she was born as a, uh, in a small farming village. And true, from true. that village, she moved uh, to Lhasa, Tibet's capital and became the first family absolutely and, yeah. and then from there to go into exile where you just have barely the clothes on your back and start, and yeah. to see all of that very true and uh, Chumo, you know she i mean she had this, some kind of an inborn uh uh i was going to say some inborn dignity you know special dignity so anyway uh, then, and I understand my. And also, I think one of the biggest things she from her is um, how she instilled a, a service uh, meaning, life of serve, meaning of um, service for all her siblings. So they all the siblings true. served yeah, yeah, yeah. His Holiness in many different capacities. True, true, true. And then with Jayum uh, Chimo is Kong Losan Samdala. And he's also one of my favorites amongst His Holiness's brothers and sisters. Not because. Now Mary Rambuche is going to see this video and say. <laughs> I know, I, <laughs> no, 
but not because he is the favorite brother of Solness, but because I had the opportunity of uh, knowing Kuang Lo San Samtalam sort of more closely a uh, few years after he returned from the States and started working in Dharamsala. And then I found Kuang, of course, Kuang was a little oh, short tempered. To give background for our viewers, um, his oldness, his mm-hmm. elder brother, Lobsan Samdala, uh, was the one who grew up with him in the Potala, taking teachings and very closely with him. And later, um, after coming into exile, he served uh, in the office of Tibet in uh, Switzerland and later in the United States and lived in the United States as a private citizen and then returned to, again, India in the uh, mid 70s uh, to serve the Tibetan community. And then and, uh, uh, although he was sometimes quite short tempered, but Kong was such an unassuming uh, and uh, I think very humble. One of the one of the uh, clear indications of his humility was I remember. When is, you know, as you know, in Dharamsala, when his soulness moves out of Dharamsala and travels outside, people gather and line up on the streets to have an audience of his soulness. Mm-hmm. Now, the, uh, the important people in the government, you know, they have an opportunity to line up next to his soulness's residence inside the gate of the private residence of his soulness. Um, Bung Losa Samdala has the, uh, I don't know, you status. call it that. The status. He, the sorry. The status. Yes. Yes. Both because he is brother of the Solonist and also because he was serving the Tibetan government at the time, you know, had the uh, right to be inside the palace gates to see a Solonist off or receive him. Yet, often, Kong used to stand with the Public, I I was amazed because I wasn't so keen about that. <laughs> because at the time I was in the office, so I had special opportunity up in inside the premises. But you know, this is the kind of person Kong was, and Kong was very warm, look, mm. very warm. And then, uh, lastly, you know, uh, what also uh, one my respect to Kong was, he was so disappointed with the terrible situation in Tibet. And in fact, he he was part of the, one of the delegations that uh, traveled to Tibet in the seventies. Yes. Yes. So that was in the, that was the first round of uh, talks between His Holiness uh, representatives. uh, uh, Anyway, uh, it was the time when His Holiness was able to send a few delegations mm-hmm. to take a you know trip around Tibet, and Kong uh, took part in one of the uh, uh, trips. The delegation from His Holiness Society went to Tibet. Anyway, the, uh, Kong was so disappointed with the terrible situation in Tibet and the yearning of the Tibetan people for His Holiness. And uh, uh, in fact, I think maybe His Holiness said that Kong was really, when Kong passed away, the Solonist felt that he passed away to some extent because of his broken heart of seeing the terrible condition inside Tibet. So that kind of feeling for his own people also is one uh, reason why I had such a uh, high regard and respect for Kong also. And speaking of um, uh, feeling for uh, Tibet, your next photograph is of the Benjen Rinpoche. Oh, Tenth Benjen yes, Rinpoche. I, yes. You know, uh, in, the, in the early 60s, when, uh, when there were like uh, a feeling amongst many Tibetans, I think both inside and outside, that the Panchen Lama was kind of uh, siding with the Chinese. 
It was uh, the Panjshir Rinpoche they, had stayed in Tibet when the when His Holiness had uh, escaped. Yes, and then of course there's a long history of maybe some kind of misunderstanding between the Panjshir Lama and the Tibetan government. Anyway, whatever the case, in the beginning people had that kind of a, uh, thinking. I remember very clearly. And then in the early 60s, again, Panjshir Rinpoche also, when he was only like 24 or 5, mm -hmm. he wrote that big uh, 70,000 word yeah, uh, mm -hmm. I believe it was uh, uh, sent to Chowan Lai. Anyway, uh, it was complaining about all the hardship the Tibetan people were uh, yeah. suffering under the communist Chinese rule. And then as a result, uh, anyway, uh, Penchen Rinpoche was so brave to do that. Then as a result of that, soon after he was put into some kind of house arrest for the next eight or seven or eight years. Then later when he was, re when he was released and rehabilitated, again in the eighties, Penchen Rinpoche started speaking out for the rights of the Tibetan people. And uh, in fact, I think, now I don't remember exactly the year, 80 something, he came to Shikatsi and then made a, a speech about uh, the difficulties that Tibetans were uh, facing under, Ch under the Chinese rule. And four or five days later, he suddenly passed away. And many Tibetans suspect that he may be, you know, poisoned or, you know, killed by the Chinese. Whatever may, whatever the case may be, but I am amazed with his courage and his determination to speak out for the Tibetans under such difficult and dangerous uh, situation. Amazing! I, I have tremendous respect in that respect. Yes, oh, and um, on May 17th come, him, comes up the date uh, when uh, the reincarnation of the Benchen uh, Rinpoche that recognized by His Holiness, he was disappeared. The young six-year-old boy uh, was disappeared by the Chinese uh, government and he was still, um, we'll have a, we have, uh, don't know anything about his whereabouts and uh, the Chinese government uh, have replaced, uh, have placed their own um, Benjen Rinpoche, 11th Benjen Rinpoche in place. So um, that is uh, the situation for that uh, now. Um, and the third photograph that uh, you wanted to share is of... Um, so this meeting with Prime Minister Lal yes. Babu Shastri. Yes, sorry. His own uh, meeting with uh, Sir Lal Bahadur Shastri. Yeah, I wanted to yes say a few words about this because when Lal Bahadur Shastri became the Prime Minister, there was a clear indication that he was deeply interested in the Tibetan issue. The letters that he wrote to his holiness became longer, and there were you know immediate well not immediate but there were really quick responses to any uh, letter or appeal His Holiness made to the Prime Minister then. And then, uh, above all, uh, I think it was six, six to four, six to five, uh, during this uh, uh, Indo-Pakistani war, his Solness was advised to stay in South India until everything cooled down. So while His Solness was in Bangalore, we got a message from uh, Mr. Shakapa, mm -hmm. who was His Solness's representative in Delhi at the time. Mm -hmm. And he sent this amazing message. He said, uh, you know, he, he was called by Prime Minister Lal Pantu Shastri and, and told that the Indian government is thinking of recognizing the government, the Tibetan government in exile. 
and that you know they would uh, finalize this. He was about to go on this trip to Tashkent, some agreement to sign with the Pakistani uh, president at the time, Ayub Khan, I think. Anyway, his, he told Mr. Shakaba that he's about to go to Tashkent and on his return, they will finalize this. But unfortunately, uh, Prime Minister Lal Badu Shasti died in Tashkent. And I have no other sources to sort of corro corroborate this uh, uh, intention of uh, the Indian government to recognize. But I recently saw a article written by Pundula. Mm -hmm. Pundula at the time, I think was working in a Tibetan government uh, related to maybe foreign, foreign relations. Of course, later he became Solness's representative in, in, uh, in Delhi. Mm -hmm. So I saw an article where uh, Pindula said he went with Mr. Shakapa as his translator and he mentioned the same, same thing, yes. incident. And so, I've been listening yes. to the uh, Shakapa lecture series that he did, uh, which is now available on the Tibetan Library's uh, SoundCloud uh, online podcast in Tibetan. And Shakapa talks about this also in his uh, lecture. Oh, good. good. Yes, so good. That, no. that was so yes. we, that, and historically, we've had um, uh, a lot of bad luck, or what do you say, where things haven't been aligned or worked out and could have been different. We've been many instances. Right. Yeah. yeah. So it's if I may, really, yes. No, if I may just uh, uh, mention one more point, you know, where I think you are very correct in saying that we were unlucky. For example, uh, in the mid 80s, historians tried to. Uh, appeal to Indian leaders to review the Tibetan, yeah, to, to review the uh, Indian government's policy on Tibet because it's been over 20 years and uh, situation have situation had changed and that uh, the government of India was adopting the same policy that they adopted some 20, 25 years ago, but nobody was interested. Then when Rajiv Gandhi became prime minister. He immediately took interest and he asked his holiness to send him a memorandum on this point that his holiness raised. Mm -hmm. And his holiness sent two memoranda. And uh, he, he, he wanted to do something and he sent these two memoranda to uh, this uh, professor M. L. Sondi, who was who who had a kind of a think tank in the Jawaharlal, Jawaharlal Nehru University mm -hmm. on international relations, so he sent it to Sondi to study these two documents that His Holiness has had submitted to uh, Rajiv, Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi. Again, unfortunately, before he could do anything, Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi got assassinated. So yes, we, are, we, we were unlucky in many ways, yes. Now there is also a lot of um, Indian uh, scholars and um, 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 people who understand the Tibetan situation, again, requesting the Indian government to uh, look at Tibet situation again. So I hope in Good. these days, of political change everywhere when so many things are going on that uh, there will be again opportunities and I think these years are critical uh, for us um, so we have to through these through so you uh, oh, I want to go back Ken Sigila, your book with these uh, an illustrated biography I was first thinking illustrated biography how will this be different from all the other biographies of his wholeness but 
it's indeed special because um, you have, because photographs tell so many stories. So, um, and I'm glad you wrote it, but I didn't think you were the type who would be writing a book. So tell me, how, tell us how and why um, you just came up and um, uh, decided to write this book. You're absolutely right because uh, uh, I I wasn't uh, keen on I I wasn't even confident enough to attempt such a book, but uh, uh, and then also uh, thank you for uh, saying that the book is uh, interesting and special something special. And then you mentioned also about the uh, photographs in the book. All this actually, uh, okay, I'm getting all muddled up. Okay, let me put it this way. Uh, you are right because I wasn't keen. And in fact, uh, uh, the Indian publisher, which is called Broly Books, uh, and it's run by this brother and sister, uh, Kapil and Priya, Kapil Kapoor and Priya Kapoor. They run this uh, publishing house. They had requested Narendra Mbuchi to work on this book. His oldness is younger brother. Yes. And Narendra Mbuchi passed the buck on to me. <laughs> As best <laughs> and friends. Then, <laughs> and then, uh, I initially uh, sort of declined to uh, to do this book, and I, uh, you know, in writing, I told Kapil that you know I I don't want to do this, but Kapil and his sister Priya, they later came up to Dhamsala. They then talk to Narayanabuchi, talk to me. And they sort of, after that, I think they felt convinced that I should work on this book. And then they kept on pressing. And finally, I relented. Yes, like and I did I'm for glad this I talk. Relented. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. But you know, the, res the result of this good book is really due to the excellent uh, uh, team I had at Rolly Books with whom I worked. And then as for the, uh, as for the mm -hmm. really excellent collection of photographs, it's uh, uh, the credit really goes to Jane Moore. Uh, yes, Jane Moore. So it turned out to be good and people are, you know, thanking me for the book, but the Credit actually goes to this team that worked with me. Oh, oh, oh. I'm not saying this to be polite. I really meant I, I really mean it. Without them, impossible, no. Oh, oh. Yeah. Impossible. No, so it's I very special. I need to write this and we can sense all of you were people now. who love this holiness and Tibet because it comes through in the book. It comes, your heart comes Thank through you. in the book. And and, um, and, uh, and I think we have almost run out of time also for our talk today, though I could keep on talking to you for a long time. I wanted to end uh, uh, also by, uh, would you like to say any uh, closing remarks, Mr. Gijala? No, no, nothing. <laughs> Just to thank you for having me on this uh, conversation now. Oh, it's a well, thank you for joining us. And I wanted to uh, say also over here that there's a beautiful foreword written by Ngai Rumchi, and he and in the for in the foreword he says uh, he calls his holiness a comet of our times. And I really felt that was um, true, and right. that how yes. lucky we are to be able to be alive and also serve in our own little, uh, make a little contribution towards sharing his message and his work. Um, so with that, I'll end.
And thank, thank you, Tentrichla. I hope uh, we'll see you again uh, soon. Yes, me too. Thank you.